Allah Almighty gave this great glad tiding to the promised Messiah Allah Salam, that I shall cause thy message to reach the corners of the earth. It is not only today when Ahmadis all over the world witness the fulfillment of this great glad tiding, but Allah Almighty also showed signs of this fulfillment to the promised Messiah Allah Salam. The message of the promised Messiah Allah Salam had reached to all continents in his lifetime, including Australia. Therefore, history of Ahmadiyyat in Australia is spanned over 100 years. Australia is the smallest continent and the biggest island on earth, situated in the southern hemisphere. It is the world's sixth largest country by total area. Its neighbouring countries include Indonesia, East Timor, Papua New Guinea, the Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, New Caledonia to the north and New Zealand to the southeast. It is estimated that this land has been inhabited for at least 40,000 years by indigenous Australians who are called Aborigines. These people were thought to have arrived here by boat from Southeast Asia. These indigenous Australians remain isolated from the rest of the world for thousands of years and remain confined within their own specific culture and traditions. After discovery by Dutch explorers in 1606, a number of European explorers sailed the coast of Australia, then known as New Holland, in the 17th century. However, it wasn't until 1770 that Captain James Cook charted the east coast and claimed it for Britain. The new outpost was called New South Wales and put to use as a penal colony. and on the 26th of January 1788, the first fleet of 11 ships carrying 1,500 people, half of them convicts, arrived in Sydney Harbour. The population grew steadily in subsequent decades. The continent was explored and an additional five self-governing crown colonies were established. On 1st January 1901, Australia's six states and two territories became a nation under a single constitution, forming the Commonwealth of Australia. Today, Australia is home to people from more than 200 countries and its population is almost 23 million. Arrival of Muslims to Australia predates European settlement and has been traced far back as the 16th and 17th centuries. During that time, Indonesians known as Makassans used to visit Australian shores regularly and share their lives with local indigenous people throughout northern Australia through trade, ceremony and marriage. But apparently, they did not make a broader impact on Australian society. Therefore, Afghan Muslim Kamalis who came here in the 19th century are regarded as the founders of Islam in Australia. During the 1850s, when it was decided to explore central Australia, horses and other animals were used to cross the country. However, the harsh and barren Australian land proved too much a challenge for them. In 1860, the government of the day decided to introduce camels and men who can handle them in order to link inland Australia. Therefore, in June 1860, the first three Afghans with 24 camels arrived in Melbourne to participate in Burke and Will's expedition. Thomas Elder and his partner Samuel Stuckey, who, who were pastoralists in Australia, South Australia, uh, decided that they would send a little expedition to India, pick up some camels and come back. And on this trip he was able to uh, uh, load up a ship with camels and he brought uh, back uh, camel handlers and they brought in uh, uh, well approximately 25 camel handlers, I think, in the, we don't know their names, some of their names then appear here and there, but, but essentially we know that they were recruited um, in and around uh, Karachi, Karachi and, exactly. and, and probably the Sindh area. Sindh area yeah. Yeah. That was the start, and then, in the next five decades, more than 2,000 Muslim Kamalis and thousands of camels arrived in Australia. These Kamalis and their animals made a significant contribution in discovering inland Australia. These Kamalis opened up the outback, helped with the construction of the overland telegraph line and railways, erected fences, acted as guides for several major expeditions and supplied almost every inland mine or station with its goods and services.
these pilots of the desert made a vital contribution to Australia. One of the famous Afghan achievements in Australia is the train link of Port Augusta and Alice Springs, known as the Gan Rail Link. After the completion of the railway in 1889, the South Australian government, in appreciation of Afghan workers, gave it the name Afghan Express or Rail Afghan. Today this rail link is famous by the name Gan Express, short for Afghans. These Afghans used to live on the outskirts of major towns, therefore these areas used to be called as Ghan towns. And they, they were living there in, in a sort of rudimentary accommodation, uh, shanty town yes, I think yeah. you, you'd yeah. call it, uh, and um, people, some of them probably owned the, the blocks that yeah. they were maybe beginning to build houses on, but a, a number of them were living in sort of dormitory accommodation yeah. Yeah. I guess. Um, and they, or, or, or in tents, and they'd set off and they'd come back, and you know, a lot of the time they'd be on the road. Islam played an important part in their lives of Afghans in Australia. Almost everywhere they went, they constructed mosques, small or great. The first mosque was built in 1861 in Mari. Later on, they built larger mosques in Adelaide in 1888, in Perth in 1905 and in Brisbane in 1908. One of these Afghans, Muhammad Hassan Musa Khan Sahab, is a historical figure who accepted Ahmadiyat in 1903 and was the first Ahmadi of Australia. Hassan Musa Khan Sahab was an educated Afghan who had studied in universities of Sindh and Bombay. He was an expert in five oriental languages. In Australian literatures, Hassan Musa Khan Saab has been mentioned as well-educated or high-educated Indian. Indeed, Hassan Musa Khan Saab was one of the leaders of the Muslims in Australia. An authority of this subject, the writer of the book Tim Mosques and Khan Towns writes, he became spokesperson for the Western Australian Afghans, indeed at times for all the Afghans in Australia. And actually, he, he was he was conscious of the what you could call the diaspora of Islam yeah, yeah. in countries that were not uh, predominantly Islamic, yeah. and I believe he he was connected to a network uh, of of other similarly well-educated um, Muslims through the world, oh, right. yeah, yeah. through the world, I think. Uh, so he, he, he really is a most fascinating fellow I mean, uh, and, and he ran a news agent, a news, news agency in, uh, in Perth. Yep. In 1904, Muslims of Western Australia bought a land in Perth to build a mosque. Hazrat Sufi Hassan Musa Khan Saab was a foundation member and was the first secretary of the mosque and he served in that capacity for many years. It, it is interesting that Hassan Musa Khan, who wrote the book, which is the sort of account of how the Perth Mosque was, was built and who subscribed to it, and he was one of the key people to raising, raise money for that, that he documented the sort of tribal affiliation of all those who were contributing money. Yeah, I think he, he, he was a tremendous figure. And, he must and, have been. Must and 1903 is the period when he's writing a lot of those letters to the newspaper. Yeah. So he's really become uh, socially aware and, and, and active. Hazrat Sufi, Hazrat Musa Khan Sahib Rasulullah had two brothers and both of them were the companions of the promised Musa al-Islam. And it was through them that Hazrat Hassan Musa Khan Sahib came to know about the promised Messiah al-Islam. And in September 1903, he wrote his letter of back to promised Messiah al-Islam. Replying to that letter on behalf of the promised Messiah al-Islam, Hazrat Mawlwi Abdul Karim Sahib Sihal Koti wrote to Hazrat Hassan Musa Khan Sahib that his bath has been accepted by the promised Messiah al-Islam. And that letter is dated 3rd of October 1903. During the 5th Khalifa's visit to Australia, in his Friday sermon of the 14th of April 2006, His Holiness talked about Hassan Musa Khan Saab and said, Sufi 
اولین موسی ہیں اور حضرت مسیح علیہ السلاۃ والسلام نے جب اعلان فرمایا وسیعت کا تو اس کے تین مہینے کے بعد ہی تقریباً انہوں نے وسیعت کر دی تھی اور اس طرح آپ کی وسیعت مارچ انیس سو چھ کی ہے حضرت صوفی حسن مسا خان صاحب رضی اللہ تعالیٰ عنہ ونٹ بیک ٹو انڈیا ان نائنٹین ٹویلو اینڈ But during his stay, he seek advice from Hazrat Khalifa al-Masih Abul Razi Allah Ta'ala Anhu, who told him, uh, you go back to Australia and it is better for you. So, as by advice of Hazrat Khalifa al-Masih Abul Razi Allah Ta'ala Anhu, Hazrat Sufi Sahib came back and he never returned back to India. He served here in Australia almost 30 years as honorary missionary of Jamaat-e Ahmadiyya. and he died here on 18th of August 1945 and was buried in Karakata Cemetery in Perth. The year 1903 is important in the history of Ahmadiyyat in Australia because that year an Australian born met the promised Messiah Allah Salaam in Gardian. His name was Mr. Charles Francis Sivright who was born in Melbourne in 1862 as a Catholic. He converted to Islam in 1896 and changed his name to Muhammad Abdul Haq. Mr. Sevright travelled to India in 1903 as a representative of the British and Empire League of Australia. Muhammad Abdul Haq Sahib was the representative of British and Indian Empire League. And as a representative of that league, he went to India in 1903 to attend a conference of the Congress in Madras later that year. And actually, it was this visit to India when he met Promised Messiah In October, he was in Lahore, where he delivered a lecture. And after that lecture, he was approached by two Ahmadis, uh, Mia Mirajdin Umar Sahib and Hakim Noor Muhammad Sahib. And both of those Ahmadis invited him to visit Qadian and actually meet the Promised Messiah So on 22nd of October, 1903, Muhammad Abdul Haq Sahib was in Qadian and he stayed there for a couple of days. He attended the dars of Hazrat Hakim Olvi Nuruddin Sahib anhu, and also he had the privilege to meet Promised Messiah and ask questions. He stayed there for two days and then left. At that time he did not accept the Ahmadiyyat and actually it was almost two and a half years after in early 1906 when he was in New Zealand he made that announcement through uh, an article that appeared in April 1906, Review of Religion. And since then, he was an Ahmadi. And, uh, but shortly after that announcement, he moved from New Zealand to, to USA and spent rest of his life there. Mr. Charles Sevright, also known as Mr. Abdul Haq, wrote an article that was published in the Muslim Sunrise in October 1922, in which he mentioned his conversion to Islam, travel to India, meeting with the Promised Messiah, Allah Salaam, as well as he reiterating his connection with Jamaat Ahmadiyya. He writes, This meeting with Ghulam Ahmad in Qadiyan in the year 1903 was a wonderful proof of the truths of Islam that words which had been uttered 1300 years ago were then being fulfilled. Nothing astonished me more among all the extraordinary incidents during my missionary travels than the finding of myself in that sacred place and face to face with its Messiah. Eventually when I was presented to him and eyes looked into eyes he knew me to Abdul Haq and I knew him to be the divinely appointed one to call the true believers together again to make the world safe for Islam. After the advent in America of Mufti Muhammad Sadiq I have further fulfilled my pledge to associate with the Ahmadiyya movement in Islam. Yet another prominent Ahmadi and companion of the Promised Messiah Allah Salaam, in Australia was Professor Clement Raig. Professor Raig was a renowned astronomer of his time. He was born in England but spent most of his professional life in Australia. He was a founding member of the Royal Meteorological Society of Australia. He is also credited to give names to cyclones, a practice that is used till today. In 1908, Professor Clement Raig uh, was visiting India as part of his world tour and during that time he delivered many lectures on astronomy. In May 1908 he stayed for a very short period of time in Lahore. And there he uh, delivered a lecture. 
And after that lecture, Hazrat Mufti Muhammad Sadiq Sahib Razila approached him and told him about the claims of the Promised Messiah He was very much surprised and uh, expressed his desire to meet Promised Messiah in person. And the meeting was arranged and he came to meet Promised Messiah on 12th of May 1908 after Zahar prayer. And after the first meeting, uh, after a few days, he again approached uh, Hazrat Mufti Muhammad Sadiq Sahib and requested if he can meet the Promised Messiah again. He was very lucky enough to get that permission and he met Promised Messiah again on 18th of May 1908, just eight days before the Promised Messiah passed away. Professor Clement Ray spent later part of his life in New Zealand and died there in 1922. During his tour to New Zealand in 2006, Hazrat Khalif al Masih V may Allah strengthen his hands, met the grandchildren of Professor Clement Raig and also visited his grave and prayed there. There were many other Hamdis who came at the start of the 20th century to Australia and among them in Queensland it was Ali Bahadur Khan Sahib, in New South Wales uh, it was Shadi Khan Sahib and the first Hamdi of Adelaide was uh, Muhammad Alam Kandhari Sahib. All of these Hamdis uh, remained here in Australia for almost half a century probably without uh, the knowledge of each other's existence. But even after living such a long period of time here in Australia, they kept their faith in the Promised Messiah And when they died, they left the mark of their faith on their graves. Apart from these early Ahmadis, there were Ahmadis who came to Australia in the 40s, 50s and 60s for business or education purposes, but none of them stayed here permanently. Hazrat Chaudhary Muhammad Zafullah Khan Saab also visited Australia in 1965 and met Governor General Lord Casey and Prime Minister Sir Robert Menzies. A new phase in history of Ahmadiyyat in Australia dawned in the 1970s when Dr. Ijazul Haq, former Vice Principal of Lahore Dental College, and Rana Muhammad Amjad Khan Saab from Pakistan, and Mr. Shamsuddin Khan and his family from Fiji migrated to Australia. These Ahmadis and a few others started to meet regularly and Alhamdulillah by middle of 1979 Jamaat was properly established with the permission of Hazrat Khalif al Masih III. In his address on day two of Jalsa Salana 1979 in Rabwa, Hazrat Khalif al Masih III Rahmatullah said, New Jamaat has been established in Australia. Uh, Huzur Zawaiti II me Europe ki darafe تشریف لے گئے تھے اور خوش قسمتی سے میں بھی اس کافیلہ کا ایک ادنا سا ممبر تھا تو حضور کی خواہش یہ تھی کہ اب مشرق کی طرف ہم جائیں اور چونکہ حضرت خلیمت المسیح سالس رحمہ اللہ کی یہ خواہش تھی کہ یہاں زمات اس طرح قائم ہوا اور زمات اس طرح سے قائم ہوا After the approval of Khalifat المسیح the fourth رحمت اللہ علیہ a land of 28 acres was bought in Marsden Park and it was on the blessed day of 30th September 1983 when Hazrat Khalif al-Masih IV Rahmatullah himself laid the foundation stone of Al-Masjid Bait al-Huda followed by the companion of the promised Messiah Allah Salam Hazrat Maulvi Muhammad Hussain Sahib Razi Allah Anhu. The ceremony of laying the foundation stone of Batul Huda was widely published in Australia and abroad. During his tour, Hazur gave interviews to local, state and national media, delivered lectures at Riverston School, National University of Canberra and attended receptions given in his honour. The tour of Hazrat Khalif al Masih IV proved to be a remarkable turning point in the history of Ahmadiyyat in Australia. Jamaat was more organised and focused. In 1984, Jamaat Ahmadiyya Australia held its first Jalsa Salana when only 80 people attended. With that humble beginning, Jalsa Salana has become an international Jalsa in which thousands of Ahmadis from different parts of Australia and neighbouring countries attend. The first Amir and missionary in charge of Australia, Mr Shaquille Ahmed Munir Sahab, came to Australia in 1985. And in the same year, for the first time, the magazine of Jamaat Ahmadiyya Australia Al Huda was published. During the centenary year in 1989, Hazrat Khalif al Masih IV 
visited Australia again to inaugurate Batul Huda Mosque. It was Friday and it was Eid al-Adha. After Eid and Friday prayers in the afternoon of the 14th of July 1989, Hazur officially inaugurated Batul Huda Mosque, the first Ahmadi Mosque in Australia. On 17th July 1991, Mahmud Ahmad Shahid Saab came to Australia and assumed his responsibilities as Emir and Missionary in Charge Australia. At that time, there were only a few Ahmadis in Australia. As per guidance of Hazrat Khalif al Masih IV, Mahmud Ahmad Shahid Saab informed the officials about plight of Ahmadis in Pakistan. So, if you have a lot of people who are not going to be able to do it, you can't get a little bit of 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 a तो लेख देंगे काट देंगे काट देंगे फिर जब दरख्वास्त गया तो उसकी रिजल्ट जो है ना वो हैरान कुंठ थे उन्होंने कहा पचास बंदे आएंगे तुम्हारे तो हुजूर बड़ा खुश हुए हुजूर ने फरमाया कि मैं चॉइस करूंगा कुछ किस लिए आना है तो पहले तीन ग्रुप हुजूर ने इस तरह चॉइस किया तो पहला ग्रुप सिडनी में आए दूसरा ग्रुप आए उधर ब्रिस्बन तीसरा आपके Melbourne. 2006 is that blessed year where once again the Khalif al Masih blessed Australian soil with his arrival. Hazrat Khalif al Masih V, may Allah strengthen his hands, attended the 22nd Jalsa Salana Australia. Subsequently, he visited Brisbane, Adelaide, and Canberra Jamaats. He also laid the foundation stone for Khilafat Centenary Hall. In October 2006, Jamaat Ahmadiyya Victoria bought a huge facility that will be served as a place of worship, mission house and a community centre. In that place, which is now officially called Ahmadiyya Centre Melbourne, up to 2,000 people can offer prayers at one time. It also has guest rooms, offices and library. In Brisbane, Jamaat had purchased a land and a small namaz centre was built on it. Now, after approval from council, Jamaat is building the second purpose-built mosque of Australia. And Hazur, may Allah strengthen his hand, will inaugurate that mosque during his visit to Australia in 2013, inshallah. While in Adelaide, Jamaat has also purchased the land to build a mosque and a mission house. In the last 20 years, Jamaat Ahmadiyya Australia has progressed remarkably. Even still a small organisation, Jamaat Ahmadiyya is known as a peace-loving and peaceful organisation on both local and national levels, whose motto is, love for all, hatred for none. In all states, Jamaat Ahmadiyya takes active appeal. Blood donations. Australia's biggest morning tea. Each year Jamaat Ahmadiyya Australia celebrates Australia Day with great enthusiasm and excitement. These activities not only make Jamaat Ahmadiyya stand out among others, but also help it to convey the true teachings of Islam and the Quran to the rest of Australians. These humble efforts of the Jamaat are recognised and appreciated at different levels, from media, from politicians, from charity organisations and from the general public. And as a result, Introduction of Ahmadiyya is extending to the wider public. In 2012, Jamaat Ahmadiyya's Jalsa Salana was awarded as the best community event of the year in local council. 
Due to Jamaat Ahmadiyya Australia, Nizam Jamaat has been firmly established in neighbouring islands such as Solomon Islands, Vanuatu and New Caledonia. In short, Ahmadiyya is progressing by leaps and bounds across the world as per the promise of Allah Almighty to His promised Messiah and Mahdi of that age. उफक से निकला सहर का तारा उठो जवानों उठो खुदारा ना होगा सुस्ती से अब गुजारा कि वक्त का है यही इशारा इमाम ने है तुम्हें पुकारा इमाम ने है तुम्हें पुकारा इमाम ने है तुम्हें पुकारा इमाम ने है तुम्हें पुकारा